Kia ora, Jamie. Thank you very much for talking to us today on RNZ National. Tell me about the, the way that relationships and friendships form under the most intense of circumstances. Yeah, it, become, it comes down to the, the actual experience itself. So um, on the first two tours in Afghanistan, obviously we had, um, you know, we're on long range reconnaissance patrols, so our engagements were quite far away. But, um, you know, in Kabul, in the next two tours, combat tours, um, we're in confined spaces, you know, it was a close quarter battle, you know, there was a suicide attack and a guy wearing suicide vests with automatic weapons, you know, just around the corner. Um, so they're pretty intense. The long range engagements aren't, aren't too bad, you know, you, you will form relationships there, but it's the stuff that's right around the corner is where things get quite tight um, because you see people for who they are and it's not for everyone. Um, and, and that's just the way it is and you'll only find that out when you, when you get in there. Um, and, and I've seen that as well, but um, you know, when you go through those experiences, you know, and you're seeing your mates getting uh, dropped on the ground, whether or not they've been uh, shot, you know, um, you know, they hit a landmine or, you know, they've taken the full brunt of a suicide um, vest um, from a suicide attacker in a room, um, you know, and you have to pull them up out of the, out of the smoke and the, and the rubble, uh, thinking that might be dead, then, um, yeah, there's a certain connection that gets made in those moments um, that uh, lasts for life. And, you know, I just had a text last night from a guy that I um, had been hit by a suicide vest um, in the Intercontinental Hotel and, and we got pretty deep on the conversation around, um, you know, uh, what he appreciated about me and, you know, and the fact that I was glad that he actually survived that because I actually thought he was, he was dead um, and that he can now enjoy life uh, with his son. So those kind of conversations don't normally occur between two hard men, um, but we, we know and it's only between me and him um, how we discuss these things, so yeah. We'll talk about the Intercontinental hotel a little bit later on. Take me back to the beginning though and did you always want to be a soldier? Uh, yeah I think I did. Do you know why? No, no. When I left the regiment I had a look at my file, <clears throat> it was quite a big file and I decided you know I'd start back at the start just to have a look at my um, uh, recruitment papers. It had all my test scores and bits and pieces which I was interested in. I was like oh that's why I went to the infantry. Um, <laughs> and then I got to the back and it said um, the last question was, what are your aspirations in the army? And I just put four words to join the SAS. Now that was when I was 17 and a half. I, don't, I have no idea why I put that, but I, well, I put that there. Um, we lived out in West Auckland. Um, I knew the SAS were a special unit and they, lived, they were out at Hobsonville, but that was about it. Um, so at 17 and a half, I definitely had the, the intention to go there. Two years later, you know, um, I went on my basic training um, so I, I finished basic training in 1994, um, did my core training which ended about uh, the third month of um, 1995 and then I did my first selection in 1996. So I was always wanting to get after it, you know, and um, yeah, I guess I was just intrinsically motivated. Uh, maybe that was my destiny, I'm not too sure, but um, yeah, when you look at the, that pattern um, and that, that sequence, um, there's something in me that just wanted to get in there no matter what. Because it was a bit of a spur of the moment decision for you joining the army, wasn't it? Pretty much, yeah. So uh, I got rang up on a, on a weeknight, I think, just after work at about seven o'clock. Um, I actually thought I wasn't going to get in the army. I was 19 at that stage. Um, and I thought, oh man, I I'm not too sure if you know, they're even going to consider my, um, my application. Um, and so the recruiter called me up and said, hey, Jamie, we've lost about 20 or 30 people off the um, current uh, recruit course. And... Um, you know, we're trying to fill numbers, so you've got an hour to, to make a decision, you know, and whoa. Um, and a whole hour. <laughs> okay, a whole hour. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if you give me the, uh, the green light, then you're going to be down there pretty quick. And, um, you know, the day after tomorrow, essentially. And so, I was, and so, you know, you're not ready for that type of thing. It's a complete life change. And so, um, you know, typical 19-year-old rang my mum, mum, you know, uh, what do you reckon I should do? And she said, Jamie, this is a big life decision. You need to make it for yourself. So I got off the phone, sat in the lounge. And I thought, you know, this is everything I wanted to do, so uh, I'm, I'm going to need to push play on that. Uh, call me back. I said yes, and then, yeah, the next day we just picked up all the items we needed to, and then two days later I'm, you know, marching with a group of other people that have been called, you know, and um, in the snow in Wairu, getting yelled out by the instructors, and, yeah, it's all she wrote. How would you describe the SAS, tra uh, the SAS training to... How would you convey it to people who haven't been in the army? There's two parts to it. There's um, kind of your foot in the door um, uh, selection process and that's probably going to be the hardest 
physical, mental, emotional, spiritual um, journey you ever go on in your life. Um, and I can tell you that straight up, it's, it's one of those things you won't want to do twice. Um, although I did do it twice. You I did, did do one it twice half. Then. Yeah, I yeah. did one half, and then and then I decided to come back and do the other one and, and get it done. Uh, it's nine days of basically just stripping you down. Um, you know. Uh, you know, and we're looking at you at, at the highest function of any say, soldier carrying a heavy weight on your back by day and night, any season weather or terrain, sleep deprived, food deprived, under the time pressure all the time, um, and, and that kind of thing. And so, you know, nine days is a long time, and um, the first day starts with you basically uh, getting drained of all your energy, and then you do a number of um, activities, including a barrier test. By the end of it, totally destroyed, um, highly emotional, um, feet are swollen, laces are undone. Um, pain everywhere, it's uh, not for everyone and nor should it be because um, selection will replicate some of the, some of the um, experience that you'll have on operations and so having been through the whole process and, and, and done selection and been on operations and training and stuff like that, it's perfectly designed for those type of conditions. And then past that point, if you're lucky enough to um, get accepted, then you've got 11 months of training and you're under the microscope again. So we're trying to build the special forces skills, uh, skill sets into you at a basic level and then um, you know, having, giving you the ability to operate. But um, you're still seen as an individual with your individual skills, but you also need to uh, see you working as a team. Um, and, you know, and then they've got to see you um, demonstrating the culture as well, which is quite difficult. And then you get through the selection process but then, as you say, there's another 11 months to get through and that's not a situation that most people make it through either. No, that's right. A very small percentage of people um, on any of the selection courses will pass, maybe 2 3%. I'm not too sure what the percentages are, very low. Um, and then, you know, you might do a couple of selection courses a year, you'll have a group of people and then they get whittled down again. So it, it, distills, its down, it distills itself down into the cream of the crop. The biggest thing that I... Um, was surprised about was um, perceptions, um, not only as the soldier that was within the um, the process of the cycle of training, but also as the directing staff was, you can't really pick who will pass. They may look good on paper, mm. they may be a high performing, fit, you know, amazing soldier, um, but suddenly put, putting them in that environment throws them out and they, they can't survive. And so you get all types, all types of body shapes. I mean, one of the officers we had on our, our course had a bit of an engine on him and um, when he first turned up, because I wasn't on the selection course, um, you know, this is me he, he, back in the day, young young fella, and I was thinking, oh man, I should be able to take this guy out, you know, and running. No, nah, he was the fastest runner of everyone the whole year, you know what I mean? So it's this, it comes down to the mindset, you know, and this, this is what's going to help you pass um, and the ability to adapt and assimilate information quickly and there's, there's a lot of other things that come with that, but yeah, it's a uh, long, drawn out process. So you become an SAS soldier, you go to Afghanistan, what was your first impression of the place? Oh amazing, just an adventure playground essentially, I mean when we first went over there um, we were doing mobility patrols, so that was mounted on Humvees. Um, and How did you get the Humvees though? Oh we got the Humvees off the Americans, they just gave them to us and um, as I said uh, in the they book. didn't just give them to you, though, did they? They didn't just give yeah, them to you. Yeah, there's a transaction. <laughs> well, there's the transaction, and the book, Jamie. Yeah, and in the book, um, yeah, we uh, gave them a couple of trays of Lion Red, I think we had at the time, Lion Red, um, and a couple of bottles of whiskey, um, and that sort of smoothed the wheels uh, to give us the, the gear that we wanted. We had these vehicles, we had a couple of motorbikes at the front, and I, I had the, um, uh, the privilege of being an outrider, and basically outriders just go ahead of the convoy and... And, uh, and you're on a motorbike? Yeah, basically yeah. a motorbike. So we only had Kawasaki 250s back then, you know, from New Zealand, which was like a little farm bike, you know, really, and at our altitude they don't perform that well, so you just have to work a little bit harder. You know, once we got out there, once we got out, <coughs> out and away from um, a lot of the main city of Kandahar and we're getting out into the environment, it's an amazing place, you know, big flat desert plains, massive um, mountains, um, you know, people are amazing uh, in general. Um, obviously, you'll get uh, your uh, a hostile reception from different tribes. Um, it just depends. But we're not going in there, you know, all guns blazing and behind armour and that kind of thing. We've got we've got no armour on our vehicles. We're always uh, there to have a conversation about things just to um, satisfy our information requirements. But yeah, amazing people in general. Um, very hospitable. Sit down, have meals. You know, have your chai and bits and pieces so hopefully at some point Afghanistan can open its doors up 
to the rest of the world because uh, yeah, you'll be seeing a lot of a lot of adventurous yeah, adventurers going out there and, and getting uh, getting after it. You write several times, and you are at pains in the book to talk about how it was a hearts and minds operation. People think about the SAS going in and killing everyone and you know anything that moves. Why do you think that's the perception people have of the SAS? Um, probably books they've read. Uh, maybe particular people, you know, maybe they're watching uh, SAS uh, UK and whatever. They're just that people will have a perception of that. Um, I think people think we're like assassins. Maybe that we run around in ninja suits and, and that kind of thing. Do you not do that? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, New Zealand's base um, of operations is generally peacekeeping, you know, around the world um, as part of the UN. Um, there's a lot of postings that we go to there. You know, you have a look, there's, uh, you know, we had a, a significant presence in East Timor as well. We've all been through those as our young soldiers and officers. And so for us, that hearts and minds piece is, is uh, very easy and genuine and normal. And what does hearts and minds involve? Um, it involves um, essentially um, you know, connecting with the uh, local population generally, and it's just about your approach. And so, you know, if we turn up at a village, we're not, again, we're not going in all guns blazing. We're sort of going in there asking people, you know, where, where's your leadership, where's your governor? Can we sit down, have a conversation about things and um, find out what's going on? There's a lot, a lot of different uh, information requirements that we had, and it wasn't always about, um, you know, where the Taliban were, although, you know, we need to know about that because the people have been repressed for a long, long period of time as well, and I'm sure a lot of them wanted to see them off too. And we're there to do that, um, as well as a whole lot of other things, you know, rebuilding um, communities and bits and pieces. Humans are humans. They know when you're being genuine and when you're not being genuine, you know. And, um, you know, other nations do it a little bit differently, and, and we do too. But the proof's in the pudding. You'd look at uh, a New Zealand Defence Force there in Bami, and we're the first province, uh, you know, that was the first province to be handed over to um, the government and then we moved on because of the amazing amount of work that we did. There were though civilian casualties as part of the international operation and the New Zealand troops were part of the international operation. So how did that play when you turn up in a new place and there may well be families or people there who've had family members killed by the international forces? Yeah, 100%. And they're not gonna be, you know, they're gonna be coming for you. Oh, 100%, yeah, I mean, I um, <clears throat> there was a situation where um, we drove through a village. I was, I was a vehicle commander at the time, driving through this village, and we're basically going through the main boardwalk area of, of the village, the, the, the main sort of market, <clears throat> and they had these raised sort of footpaths. Anyway, I was, um, we're driving through, and um, all of a sudden I just saw a little bit of movement out the corner of my eye. A, a guy came out of a shop like real super quick, and then um, two guys pulled him back into the, into the shop, and um, my gunner yelled down and said, hey, uh, that guy tried to stab you in the head. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, yeah, he tried to stab you in the head. And so I said, okay, all vehicles stop. I got out of the vehicle um, with the interpreter <clears throat> and um, went into the shop and this guy was in the back of the shop and he was sort of breathing quite heavily. And, um, and the, the, the two guys are still with him, holding him back. And I said, oh, hey, you know, what's going on? And um, at, at the start, they sort of just looked around, said nothing. I said, hey, what's going on? What happened there? And, um, my friend just said that, um, you know, he came out and tried to stab me. Um, and, the, and they came around and they said, hey, um, this guy's brother was killed by the coalition um, and he wanted to have vengeance. And unfortunately he turned up and, and that was the way it is. And I went, I said, okay. And I understood when I had that discussion with him. It's like, yeah, okay, I get where you're coming from. And I said, okay, well, um, well, I'm really sorry that this has happened. Um, you know, we are part of the coalition, but uh, we didn't actually do anything. And um, I understand where you're coming from, but um, I'm probably not the right one to be directing your anger at. Um, and so, yeah, sorry about your loss, and we just got on the vehicles and carried on. Now, I'm not too sure if other people would be doing that, um, whether they take a heavy-handed approach, but again, hearts and minds operations, just uh, see it for what it is and, and carry on with your business. You went to Afghanistan um, in terms of going for big chunks of time four times. As you were bouncing back, from places like Afghanistan, from other operations like Timor. What was it like coming back to normal life? Uh, very difficult. Um, yeah, you are changed when you come back. It's just hard not to be when you go through some of those experiences. Um, you know, 
I've seen and done a lot. Um, you know, I've seen friends of mine um, that have had their you know legs removed from landmines. Um, they've been shot. You know, been significant uh, contacts and bits and pieces. So that stuff changes you. We know that, and it's a uh, you know um, high threat environment, low threat environment, and that's essentially what you're going to on the extreme edge. You know, high threat on the extreme edge, warlike, back to New Zealand, peace. You know, that type of thing. And so, one of the things that I found was. Um, my mind was three quarters of the way or more back back on, at the operational theatre and we'd come back to New Zealand, we, we would normally fly back to New Zealand pretty quickly, we'd have site debriefs in the Middle East and then and then jump back, but we'd be back within a week. Um, no and decompression and that, as such? Oh, kind of, like a little a, bit? A day, a day, you know. What do you do on decompression to, to oh, get out of your just, zone? Oh, head. we'd just go down to um, like the, the like a water park and you know go play around in the water and just and just sort of um, you know that kind of thing. Um, you know, might have a few beers or that kind of thing. But by then, everyone's just sort of focused on getting home back to their families. You know, you're back within a week. Um, you know, I'm standing outside camp. I remember one time <clears throat> I was standing outside camp and it was night time. Um, and we'd come back from one of the uh, one of the sort of I think it was in, uh, in 2011. We came back from that that particular tour, which was quite hectic. And um, I actually thought I was dreaming. I actually couldn't quite. Uh, I, I I wasn't realising where I was. I was still back there. You know, I'd only just come off. You know, within a week I'd come off um, standby. Um, suddenly I'm outside uh, the fence. No weapons. None of the boys are around me. Um, just trying to. You know, the cogs were slowly wrapping around the fact that I was back in New Zealand, but it takes a long time. And as I said before, you know, you get past that, I got picked up, you know, went home, um, woke up in the morning, um, and, you know, thinking I'm going to be waking up in, in Afghanistan, and I'm, suddenly I'm at home, and it's very, very strange. And, you know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and there'd be a bit of paranoia, and I'd be like, you know, I'd, I'd be registering that the threat that's not there. And so I'd go around and lock, make sure the doors were locked come back to my room, try and go to sleep, you know, and then I'm thinking maybe I should have a, you know, a rifle under my bed just in case you just got to, you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, dial yourself into where you are, you know, and, and that's the thing. But you would see how people can go, it can go horribly wrong for some people um, if they don't take control and understand what is happening, you know, that reintegration process. Is it the kind of thing that you can talk about with family and friends or is there so much to tell that you could talk to them forever and they still won't get it? Pretty much. And I'm not too sure how my family um, knew how to act around me either, you know, because I'd heard about stuff that I'd done as well and I'd try and tell them, but then, yeah, they, you, don't, yeah you don't really understand because you've got to have the whole, the whole picture because it's all of it right. It's leaving, it's being there, it's coming back and, and knowing what was happening. And at that point in time, I wasn't really being deep and meaningful about what was going on, you know, I remember flying out, every time I used to fly out I'd look back at New Zealand and wonder if I was going to, you know, be there, back there in person, you know, and then you've got to shelve those thoughts and get on with what you're doing. Like, is this the last time you're going yeah, to see Yeah, it's it? the last time, yeah. yeah, last time I'll see my family and that kind of thing, you've got to make peace with that pretty quick. Um, I'm not too sure if you How do you make peace with that? Um, just focusing on what I had to do, you know, again, I'm there to represent New Zealand and every time I used to roll out the gate um, on both those operations, you know, the safe area, Again, it's the same thing. Am I, am, I, am I coming back alive or am I coming back in a body bag? You know, because those are very real prospects or, you know, significantly injured. Mm. Um, but you just got to shelve it and just, and just get, on, get on with what you're doing. And, you know, I, when I, I volunteered for this and I joined, um, you know, a special elite unit that um, does complex, complex operations of high risk. And so, yeah, you've got to make peace with the fact that you are going to be either seriously injured or killed um, and, and just, yeah. Just get past the point of toiling in the aim and just get after it. Talk to me about the hotel, I guess, because you've talked about hearts and minds and how that was priority number one. But you can flex pretty quick when you need to. Yeah. So uh, we don't muck around. Um, yeah, we can go from, uh, you know, shaking hands to, you know, high order um, uh, attack if we need to. Um, that's what we're trained to do. So. Yeah, the 2011 attack, I guess, in a, in a brief sort of um, description, was um, 2011, on the 28th of June, nine terrorists attacked the uh, Intercontinental Hotel. They killed about 15 or 17 people. I don't know what the final count was there. Um, you know, unarmed uh, hotel staff, guests, um, security guards, 
and then they took positions up and around the um, the building, particularly on the roof, and started shooting at the um, Afghan National Security Forces. We turned up, and over the next 10 hours, we basically hunted them down uh, one by one um, uh, and resolved, resolved that um, particular uh, incident. 10 hours goes in a heartbeat. Um, we had a couple of guys that got wounded. Um, obviously, Steve Askin got shot through the side of the head. He took shrapnel um, when we had a gun battle in one of the stairwells. Uh, my mate, I talked about that, um, took the full brunt of the suicide vest, um, clacking off in a room, um, was lucky to walk out of there with his life. Um, so was a, that was a pretty significant event, although I didn't really register it at the time, because again, I was just focused on the job. Your memory of it, what comes back to you? Is it sights? Is it sounds? Is it smells? All of it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much burned into my brain. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, what did it sound like? Uh, it's pretty chaotic. There's a lot of shooting going on. Um, but as a ground commander, it's similar but different to everyone else because at the end of the day, I'm thinking about the whole picture. Mm. Um, as an operator, you're just, you are essentially just thinking about what your, your small part in it, in it is. So I'm thinking about the helicopter that's you know, shooting on the roof. I'm thinking about the, the you know the terrorists that are shooting off the the roof out to the uh, inner cordon and further beyond into the neighbourhoods. So I'm thinking about those people that are probably hunkered down with their families inside their houses. They probably don't want to be there or they're trying to get out of there. Thinking about the team, making sure everyone's going to come out alive if possible, um, making decisions, um, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, but you have things like obviously you have shots being fired from all sorts of different directions, shooting, a lot of yelling, um, a lot of people moving around. Um, you see people's reactions, um, you know, looks of shock and disbelief at times from people um, because things have happened that they weren't um, prepare, prepared for. Um, yeah, yeah, people, people lying down that you potentially have been killed. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff, a lot of action, a lot of, a lot of things going on, a lot of things to contemplate, um, you know. But as I said before in the book that um, I had the benefit of being in a um, pretty acute sense of flow that meant my, my mind was wide open and it made my decision making very, very, not simple, but um, well considered and I, I knew exactly what we needed to do and at what time, um, taking into account everything that was going on around me. What's it like though when you see some of your mates, some of your comrades being injured or being in situations where you don't know, even if it's only for a few moments, whether they're going to live or die? Yeah, it's a kick in the guts, but um, we train thousands and thousands of hours back in New Zealand and, and in other places around the world day and night um, to prepare ourselves for these particular situations. And we've done, done so many different scenarios, you know, where people have been, um, you know, taken out of battle, they have significant injuries, you have to deal with that and do evacuations and stuff like that. It's very procedural. So um, I think in terms of preparing you for battle, we do a very, we do very, very well. And then therefore the effects of battle um, it kind of takes the edge off a bit. But how do you cope when it all stops? Um, again, the, um, that transition back to New Zealand is, is, quite, um, it is quite difficult. Um, for me, um, I guess I was just going with my emotions at the time, because at the time I, I wasn't really being self-aware. But as time went on um, and I started to grow tired of, um, you know, feeling tired, um, because I got to full burnout by the end of my career and that's not a fault of the regiment. It's, um, it's probably both ways really, you know, a bit of performance punishment but also high expectations of myself um, and not taking the, the chance to rest when I needed to. Talk to me about burnout. Um, How did you get there? What was that like? Uh, burnout happened incrementally over time um, and it's something that you are not aware of because it does happen incrementally, millimetre by millimetre over time because you're just pushing, pushing, pushing the whole time. Always active, always doing stuff. But at um, some point you hit the Yeah, wall. I hit the wall. Yeah, yeah, I hit the wall. And I remember um, I just started recognising it probably in my, I don't know, maybe I'd done by that point about 12 years and um, maybe more, 12, 13 years. And I remember a, fr a friend of mine who I'd known for 20 years came into my office and I didn't even know, who, didn't even know who his, what his name was. You know, I could recognise him, but I was thinking, oh, we've got a problem here. And then, um, you know, always carry my notebook, as you do, you know, if there's a lot of information. But I had, I started recognising I had long and short-term memory loss. And now you're probably thinking, well, did you even have a memory? Not really. 
you know, and so I had to, you know, I had to search in the database to get his picture to find out who this guy was, you know, that's, that's how bad it was. And then I noticed, you know, I was like my, when I was walking, I was hunched over, you know, like hunched over walking around, you know, my feet were sort of sliding on the ground, you know, I'd trip over doorsteps, this would be normal. And, and you know, if we we're sitting in a chair, I'd be right, you know, my head would be on the back of this chair and I'd be sitting right in it and people would be like, sit up, man, what are you doing? Um, and so, yeah, I started recognising that and um, discussing it with my wife, who's a psychologist, and then, um, you know, she started help. You know, she started helping me recognise um, what was going on as well. Something needed to be done, and, and it was about that time, as we discussed earlier, that um, you know, one Sunday night, I said, oh, I think it's time for me to to call it quits. You know, I've done everything. Twenty years, you know, which is a long time, mm. and it's a long time in the SAS. You were an officer by this point. What is it about being out on the edge that you enjoy? Um, probably the adrenaline rush. You know, the regiment provides all these experiences that you wouldn't normally get anywhere in the world. You know what I mean? Like in a, in a normal civilian environment, like trying to replicate the journey in the regiment is good luck to you, you know. <laughs> Take million, millions and millions of dollars. I mean, you're jumping out of planes at night, you know, full equipment and, you know, flying around in helicopters, shooting out of helicopters. like. It's, it's fun, you know, it's not only a challenge, it's fun, you know, and, and as a young man, it's, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's something that, you, that really draws you in. What's the toll on your family as well? The toll on your family is up to you. Mm. Um, you decide what that looks like. Initially, you know, the, the expectation that I put on myself was that I'd be the first one and the last one to leave. That was just the way I was as a leader, and I thought that was the way, the way to be. So. But I couldn't do that um, when, my, when my son was born. I had to help out at home, so I had to leave at 4.30, so the boys were still there. And, um, you know, I'd get in my car and I'd get angry that I'd been, I was being pulled away from this, you know, from the regiment to go home. And I'd just get angry and angry until I got here and then, you know, basically just put my bag out on the ground and expect everyone to eat it, you know, just be annoying. A pain in the ass, really, you know. I was just being a pain in the ass around the house and not really being present, you know. And, and, and with my and with my family, which is just stupid. And so it took me a bit of time, and then I realised that, you know, what I was thinking was that she was taking me away from my, well, they were taking me away from my high strategic purpose. Selfish, you know, and so I had to re, realign my thinking. Yeah, how did you right rewire direction. your brain around that? Um, basically by leaving. And then, <laughs> this is, it all happened at the same time, you know what I mean? Like, everything happened at the same time, suddenly the realisation, um, obviously, I used to do I used to do breathing exercises before I got here, just to bring myself down. But it would it just took at the end it, it took it just my vision opened up more about some of the things that were worth taking on and on the, the rest of my journey and stuff that needed to be left behind. And it was very difficult. And um, you know, I'm still still um, a little bit like that. I'm very um, work focused, and I get distracted in that way. But um, you know, one of the biggest things is making sure that you're pr you're present right here, right now, um, with your family because essentially, you know, you're working, you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hours of the day. You only really get a couple of hours front and rear of that that working day, and so what are you going to do with it? You know what I mean? It's a small amount of time, and it's going to go very, very quickly. I mean, I look at my son now; he's nine years old. Bam! You know, he's suddenly nine years old. You know, what have I done? Um, so yeah, I try to be try to be more present and do stuff with him. So you left the SAS, um, there were various adventures and um, things that you recount in the book that you did after that with Alia, your wife. She was kidnapped at one point when you were living in Israel. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you to be on the other side of that? Because that's a conversation or that's a situation that your family could have been in about you. Yeah. So. Um well, firstly, I just wanted to jump across the border and, and get her out of there. But um, by that stage, I'd already been taken out. So the, the UN uh, did the right thing by not telling me until they were released. I remember the, the ops officer came down, knocked on my door, and I peered through the hole. So, oh, 8 o'clock in the morning. And then I thought, oh, OK, something might have happened. He came and said, oh, you got a minute? And I was thinking, oh, here, because I've seen this before. You know, it's like, what's happened? Oh, yeah, Ali was taken, taken hostage. Um, by a group, and um, and I said, okay, is she still over there? And he said, no, they're being released, and she's come across. And I said, well, where is she? Where is she now? And they're doing medical checks and debriefs and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that was that was um, scary because um, I had to um, 
you know, consider the worst possible scenario, given the information that I had that she'd been physically harmed. Um, and that wouldn't have boded well with me at that point in time. Um, yeah, so interesting to be on that side of the fence. And then, you know, it's kind of that realisation about what potentially my family were thinking about when they were seeing stuff on the news um, that we were involved in. But, um, you know, she's relatively in one piece um, in that. And, uh, yeah, and I guess we can, we sort of, when we look at each other, you know, we've been in, in those types of situations, so we understand each other a lot more. Tell me about winning the Gallantry Star and winning it anonymously. The medals, the medals don't make the man, you know, at the end of the day, your medals just show people what your experience looks like. Um, it's easy to say that when you've got one though. Oh yeah, I guess so, but again, as I've said numerous times before, and I mean it, is that, um, you know, I believe everyone on, on my team that night should have got a high award, you know, whether it's that or, or close to it, um, because everyone was there with me. Um, they all played a part in the resolution of it, like I, can't, I, I couldn't have done it without them, you know, it's not like myself and Steve Askin could have gone around there as a pair and sort of about it, although I'm sure we would have, would have given it a good crack. But um, it takes a lot of different people doing a whole lot of different things uh, for the success of that mission. And, you know, I wrote everyone up for, a, for an award for that um, particular operation, but it just doesn't work like that. You know, it goes through a process in bits and pieces. So, again, as I've said before, is that, um, you know, this team that I had at that particular point in time, and it revealed itself, was that they were a significant bunch. I knew they were anyway. We'd been in operations before, but you don't know what's going to happen in those big moments. And everyone did phenomenally. And so um, I had an A team. They made me look good as a leader, as, you, as, as A teams always do. Um, and um, yeah, it's, the reality is, is that, you know, that medal I hold for them, I don't, you know, it's not a personal thing. What is your reflection on looking at Afghanistan now with the Taliban having returned for a couple of years? Yeah, it's sad, um, but, you know, I mean, you can dwell on the aim and say it was all a waste of time, as I've seen people say around the world, um, but you know, we gave people a relative sense of peace um, in uh, specific, specific areas over a 20-year uh, period, or however long it was. Um, and so, you know, within that 20 years, people were born, uh, potentially prospered, uh, left the country and went on to do other things with their families, but were able to get about their lives, you know, so if I'd been a part of that, then, then so be it, um, you know, rather than being under a, you know, a rule of a group that um, wants to sort of keep you back in, t in the dark ages and, you know, uh, just doing certain things that don't, um, you know, exist in a progressive society. You know work at Dilworth. Mm. What sort of work does that involve you doing? Uh, so I'm the head of Mangatawhiri campus and I deliver the uh, Learning in the Outdoors programme for um, the boys. It's called Te Haidinga, The Journey. Um, and it's a longitudinal scaffolded program across ages of 7 to 13. Um, and it's very significant. It's not something that you'd see anywhere else in New Zealand, if not Australasia. What difference do you think you make for the boys there? Um, it's quite a big one. Um, the Learning in the Outdoors program, is quite, because of how significant it is, the scaffolded longitudinal nature of it, the boys get the um, ability to progress with their technical skills across a whole lot of different outdoor um, activities. But also the, the LITO program is essentially just the vessel for our flourishing curriculum, which is essentially building those positive and tangible character traits into the boys, you know, things that you can't see at the moment, stuff that's sitting, sitting inside resilience, self-efficacy, you know, self-confidence, how they engage with others in bits and pieces. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's phenomenal and, and you know, I'm, I'm just glad of been given this gift of designing the program and now implementing it. You know, the benefit of it is that um, I'm going to be able to see, you know, this year seven boy um, come in, um, having had very limited outdoor experiences, and then been able to look him in the face as he leaves to Worth at year 13 and seeing um, him change, you know, into a young man. And that's the conversation I kind of want to have is, you know, how did the Leto program transform your your um, your life essentially because uh, that's essentially what we're doing down here. Life changing. It is life changing. Yeah, and again, when we talk, even when we talk about it now, it's uh, you know I just get excited because it's, yeah, it's it's just so good to get out there 
and uh, see these boys having a good time. Obviously, challenge always comes first. Everyone hears me say this: the challenge comes first, fun is second. But they kind of meet in the middle. You know what I mean? It's it's um, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. You know, and, and the feedback that we get um, from everyone, and you know, not only the boys but from, um, from the parents as well, is that it's it's an amazing experience. Very lucky. Jamie Pennell, thank you very much for your time. It's no been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.